Okay, we're ready to get started. Hello, hello. Oh, I love seeing the early birds. I'm an early bird. <laughs> um, say hello in the chat. Good to see you again, Robert. And any ahas or breakthrough moments so far in the training? Let me know in the chat. Any kind of things that are ticking over where you're like, hmm, that's interesting. Oh, Patricia from Blackburn. Can't beat a Blackburn lass. Um, any takeaways that you just feel really like, wow, I wish I'd known that 20 years ago. Um, we are going to do some, we're going to do some great stuff today. We're going to talk about going from a fixed to a growth mindset. And um, I am going to introduce you to someone who's going to speak today, Jen, who has an amazing story that you need to hear. So lots of people who've been here every day so far. Well done. I know not everybody can get here every day and some people watch the recording. So if you're watching the recording, hello to you. Make sure you've got your um, uh, workbook with you or pen and paper because there will be stuff that you are going to want to um, write down. Good to see you, Toddy. Oh, good to see there's rain in California, Carla. We need it. Newport Beach, one of my favorite places. <laughs> Catherine from Oregon is back with my subconscious mind. Florida, Canada, UK. Any, any kind of breakthroughs or aha moments? New Jersey. Put them in the chat, North Carolina. How has this been so far? Hopefully this has been worth your time. I know when I first did this kind of training, I was like, wish they taught me in school about limiting beliefs. Limiting beliefs is tomorrow. Do not miss it. Do not miss that because that's the stuff that blew my mind. Once I, once I learned and I got it, I was like, oh, everything began to make sense. My life began to make sense. My outcomes began to make sense. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad, I'm pleased. I just, you know, sometimes you do wonder like, am I making sense? <laughs> like, does everybody know what I'm talking about when I explain things? <laughs> okay, let me just get my notes because I can't do this from the top of my head. I'm gonna do some of it. A lot of it, I know, but I do need a script because it does help me. Um, okay, so let me just have a look. Keep saying hello in the chat. I just wanna see if Jen is here yet. Jen, are you here yet? Yes, there she is. Okay, we're gonna see Jen later. Okay, Caroline's put the link to the workbook. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, Wow, Victoria's had a breakthrough. Literally just stopped myself in, in a conversation where I was giving a habitual subconscious response. See, what I'm doing is bringing this to your awareness and your awareness is in your conscious mind. And that's when you begin to notice your patterns. Yeah. Catherine, very good training. Realize I need feedback and support to get unstuck. And I'm gonna be talking about that later because I'm, I'm gonna be telling you about the five month program that's opening for enrollment today as well. For those of you who feel that you want to join that. Okay, so when you change your mindset, you your life will change. It's not just this isn't just about drinking. It's about everything. It's not just it's not just about staying away from a drink one day at a time. Ugh. It's not about not drinking. It's so much more than that. So we've learned how the subconscious mind and the conscious mind work together. We've learned about how we tell ourselves stories and get stuck in them. Um, and today we're going to learn about a fixed and growth mindset and how once we know what a fixed mindset is and a growth mindset is, we can change it and we have to be in a growth mindset to stay sober. The reason that you are struggling, the reason that you're not sober or the reason you're struggling with anything is because um, you have a fixed mindset. Everything feels better in a growth mindset and it's very simple to change once you know how. 
again, it's not about denying reality or being Pollyanna or toxic positivity. It's actually about being more in truth and less in the, I was going to say, look, less in the BS that we tell ourselves. I don't want to swear. Try not to swear. Okay. So fixed and growth mindset. And I want to talk specifically about why you are stuck and how to change that. Getting sober and staying sober is really, really hard and pretty much impossible when you're stuck in a fixed mindset. We live in two worlds, the external world and the internal world, but we get lost in the external world. And we forget that everything we need and who we really are is in the internal world. So the external world is what we look like, how much we earn, what other people think about us, what we have, what we achieve. It's the box checking. That's the external world. And we get lost in that. Does everyone make, does that make sense to everybody? So when we are drinking, we think only external things can fix us. If I lost weight, if I had a better job, if I had more money, if I lived in a different place, blah, 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 blah. A fixed mindset is stuck in external solutions. If I get this, achieve this, move here, get that relationship, job, house, then I will be okay. I, I absolutely operated on that. Uh, for me, it was about I'll be okay and I'll be safe. Like I never, I always felt like I was on quicksand. I never felt safe. And I don't mean like, like there was a physical threat to me. I just never felt like um, I was anchored. And I just thought if I just got these things, had these things, achieved these things, then I'd be okay. And, and a lot of the time I did get those things or achieve those things. And it felt okay for about 15 seconds. And then that feeling of not being anchored would come over me again. Does that make sense to everybody? So we want to move our mindset from one that is a fixed one to a growth mindset. And I want to give you an example of this. Um, so I have an 11 year old and back when he was about four or five, he was really into Pokemon. Actually, yeah, he's probably about four, still is into Pokemon. This Pokemon phase lasts a long time. Um, and he said to me one day, he said, mommy, will you draw a picture of whatever this Pokemon was? I can't even pronounce it. They have such funny names. And I, I said to him, oh, mommy's not very good at drawing. Like, like I, that's not something I enjoy and I didn't want to do it. And he went on and on, mommy, mommy please, will you draw a picture of whatever this Pokemon is? And I, said, and I was just like, oh, mommy's not very good at this. So it's probably not going to be very good. So I made an attempt and drew it. Two or three weeks later, we were doing something. I think it was something to do with maybe drawing or was cutting something out or trying to make something. And I said, oh, Sophie, why don't you do that? And you know what he said to me? He said, oh, mommy, I'm not very good at that. And I went, oh. I, I instantly saw where he had got that from. And I was like, I had role model to fix mindset to him. So next time this came around, because he went through his phase of asking me to draw things all the time, I said, you know what? I'll give it a go. Um, I, don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm a beginner. I'm still like learning a lot about drawing. I don't know if it's gonna be great, but I'll give it a go because then I might get better. That was a growth mindset. I'm a role modeled a, a growth mindset. Now it didn't change reality, but the pictures were still pretty terrible. But I enjoyed actually trying to do it with that attitude. And you know what? That role model to my son, the next time he, he went, I'm going to give it a go, mommy. I'm going to just try and see what happens. And that's, of course, as a parent, where I want my, my child to be. We fall into a fixed mindset a lot. Now, I want to point out, I have a zero desire to be good at drawing. Like I, I'm not giving any energy to that. I, I will do stuff with my kids and it's awful and it's fine and it's fun. I don't have any, like I have no desire to be good at drawing. So I'm quite happy to accept that I'm not good at drawing and not really, you know, go any further than that. But there's lots of things in my life that I do want to be better at, that I do want to kind of push myself a little bit and see if I could get better and, and see what happens. And I apply my growth mindset there. 
Can everyone kind of see the difference there and how important it is, that how important this stuff is? I'm just gonna have a quick look at the comments. Yeah. Yes, you can you can view the previous. Uh, oh, hi, Winifred. You can view the previous ones because uh, you should all be on the email list, list and you should all be getting um, emails with the replays. If not, reach out to my team, info at soberful.com if you're not getting emails or replays or anything like that. So the fixed mindset is in the subconscious mind. We don't think about it. It's connected to our limiting beliefs and it's manifested in our stories. So when we talked about that yesterday, the story that you tell yourself about yourself, you are often just relaying to people your fixed mindset. It's because of this. I'm just not good at drawing. Just not good at drawing. That's it. Sobriety is hard. Just really, it's too hard. I can't do it. It's a fixed mindset. We respond on autopilot and we stay stuck. Remember the programming. We just have these pre-programmed responses. And that's why we tell ourselves stories to explain to ourselves and to other people, but mostly to ourselves, why things are the way they are. And we can't change them. It's not our fault. We have no power. And this is why we struggle. And this is in your workbooks for those of you who've printed those off. The biggest reason you struggle is because of your fixed mindset. That's the biggest reason you struggle. This is really important. Our fixed mindset about alcohol, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday, was handed to us by our culture, our media, and our peer group. It's just programming. Our, our culture, all of us, our peer groups, all of that kind of stuff went, alcohol is just tons of fun. You'll have a great time if you drink alcohol. And we went, all right. Just in the same way that I said to my son, I'm not good at drawing. He was like, oh, I'm not good at that. Here's the thing, right? Was not drinking ever presented to you as an option? Ever? Like, was that ever presented? The only time I ever come across that is if um, someone grew up in a particular religion, like if you're Mormon or perhaps Muslim. Um, not drinking alcohol was never presented to me as an option that, you know what, you some people drink alcohol and some people don't drink alcohol. In fact, quite a lot of people don't drink alcohol and they have fulfilling lives that are fun and interesting. That was never presented to me. And I'm gonna guess it wasn't presented to you either. Does that make sense to everybody? So I was given a fixed mindset story about alcohol by every, by the external world. The external world sold me a story. I never questioned it. I went, okay. I am committed to that. I, I, I want to have fun. I'm, I'm a teenager. I want to have fun. I want to have excitement. I want, definitely want to belong and connect with people. So I, I'm, I'm all in on that one. That sounds good to me. And nobody ever told me about the cost. That was never told to me. What, what was presented in our culture is small minority of people have a really, really, really bad problem and they're really, really, really bad alcoholics and they have to stop drinking. Poor, poor them but everyone else is fine. That's what I was told. Were you told the same thing? So all those stories kept me stuck in a fixed mindset and never questioned they were true. So all of that is programming. It went into our subconscious mind. It's a fixed mindset that we tell a story about. You know, look around at all the people that you know and how they talk about drinking. Like, look at those stories because we tell the same stories. We've done the same thing. I mean, I'm ashamed to admit, I know I can look back in my early 20s and there was a couple of people I worked with who didn't drink for whatever reasons. And I remember being really like, <laughs> like bullying, actually. It was bullying, like really not letting up on how boring they were. And oh my, like, you know, teasing, but really. And I know I've had people do that to me when I.
I'm muted. Sorry, guys, the power just went funny. Am I back? Am I back? Okay, you can see. Yes, yes, yes. Praise, praise the goddess. Whew. Okay, I have no idea. Sometimes that happens here. We live in the mountains. Okay, we're back. Okay, good. Now, where was I? <laughs> um, okay, so we. <laughs> thank God the thing stayed. I'm glad that I didn't have to log back in again and all of that. Ah, it's on my phone. Hold on. Okay, guys, give me one second. I'm going to just switch to. Okay, now I think I'm definitely back. Okay, that was my, it wasn't kind of my fault. My, my computer. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, let's go. <laughs> okay, so how do we start? We start by questioning our belief system about alcohol, drinking, and sobriety. What is true and what isn't? What is the evidence? that your drinking is fun. You know, I, I'm really enjoying you guys' um, comments uh, in, in the Facebook group uh, to the homework questions and what it's revealing. Everyone can still see me, right? Yeah, okay, good. Um, I, I'm really interested in all everything that everybody's saying about um, the, the homework questions, about um, your belief systems, the story you're telling yourself. It's such a committed story. But when I say to you, like, what's show me the evidence? It's like when you deconstruct this and look at the cost of your drinking, it kind of like this whole story begins to fall apart. This whole kind of um, you know, alcohol's fun, it helps me relax. A lot of people said it helps them deal with anxiety. Oh, it doesn't, it makes it worse. That's a complete lie. It may, alcohol, using alcohol to cope with anxiety makes it worse. And I'm someone who had anxiety. I know exactly what that's like. Okay. So to get sober and stay sober and live the life we want, we have to move from a fixed to a growth mindset. So for example, here's the thing. Is it possible you could enjoy being sober? That would be, that's, that's being in the growth mindset. Just saying, is it possible? Is it possible you could enjoy being sober? Do I know anybody who's sober and looks happy and fulfilled? Who here knows somebody so, who's sober, either, either in person or maybe online, who just kind of looks like their lives are going pretty well? They look pretty happy and they, they really don't want to drink. Just those questions and that language, that's being in a growth mindset. Yeah. And yeah. And how do people's lives look? The sober people that you know. So this is in your workbook. When you have a growth mindset, you believe you can change. So write it down. When you have a growth mindset, you believe you can change. You just believe that maybe, possibly, it could be different. That's all you need to get started, by the way, guys. That's all you need to get started. And that's being in a growth mind mindset. Is sobriety boring? Well, how, do you, how would you know that if you haven't been sober for more than a few days or a few weeks? Have you ever been sober long enough to decide? Now, this bit's really important. Early, this is, because this is what, what happens. Early sobriety 
is not how it is long term. It just isn't. Early sobriety is not how it is down the road. But what happens is we stop drinking for a little bit of time and it's a massive lifestyle shift, massive. And I'm going to be honest with you, it can feel a little bit boring in the first few weeks or months. Well, I was 27 when I stopped drinking. I only stopped because I had to, because my mental health problems were so bad. I didn't want to. And everybody I knew was going out and getting wasted and to, in my perception, having a great time. And I remember one Saturday night cleaning my apartment from top to bottom, like a spring clean, because I was so like, I didn't know what else to do. And I remember thinking, is this it? Really? This is it. I am in my 20s and I'm going to spend Saturday nights on my own doing domestic chores. That is not how it stayed. I promise you. By the time I was 28 and a half, certainly 29, I was going out dancing, gigs, all of that kind of stuff sober having a great time so the most important thing for you to take away is that don't judge early sobriety by those first few weeks or months I think it's really the first year it's such a massive lifestyle shift it's not how it is long term that makes sense to everybody but then you know we do that you know we do it for 30 days and oh, this is really boring can't go out and do anything and they, well, that's how we think sobriety is we're telling ourselves that story so we can go back to drinking the fix that that fixed mindset is literally killing people. If basing your idea of sobriety on the first week or 30 days or even a few months, it, if you're basing your idea of sobriety on that, you're going to fail because it's 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 different. It's just very different and it's different for everybody. And that's why you need community. You need people you, to identify with and relate to who can say, I, I was I remember that bit. I was there. I remember feeling like that at three months sober, six months sober, 12 months sober, whatever. I remember feeling like that. It, get, it, it changes. Don't worry. That passes. It, it gets different. It gets better. That's why we need people around us. Does that make sense to everybody? So this is in your workbooks. When you have a growth mindset, you believe you can change. You are open to maybe I can get better at drawing. Maybe I will enjoy being sober. Maybe. Start there. You're not, it's, it's important you can start with something that can sit well with you. Now, what's also interesting about a fixed mindset is we have this belief system, not just about alcohol and sobriety, we have it about everything. So consider what you believe about the following, money, success, weight, children, families, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Money is somewhere else that our fixed mindset can really, really show up. We all have subconscious belief systems about money, success, abundance. Success, my fixed mindset was that was for other people, not me. I don't, I, 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 um, I, 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 my uh, limiting belief was I always mess up. So therefore, if you mess up, you're not going to be successful. So success was for other people, not for me. Money. So for example, I'll give you an example of this, my mom again. Um, when I used to live in Long Island, New York, um, it's like lots of villages and towns um, with lots of massive mansions in between. And we would drive around to different places and she would see these massive mansions, of which we don't have really so much in, in the UK because we don't have the room. And she'd be like, ooh, ooh. And she would go into her fixed mindset story about rich people she knew a rich person once and they were horrible and they were really unhappy so basically people with lots of money they're usually miserable and really unhappy and that was just the story and every time that was triggered by something seeing the big mansions she tell that story i've heard that story my whole life it's not true we again you can see this in other people and we do the same thing just have a quick look at the comments jen are you ready we're going to have you on in just a second Gratitude helps with a growth mindset, yes, but don't, gratitude is a great tool, but sometimes it can turn into toxic positivity in, I'm, I should be grateful, I just need to be grateful about all of the things that I have, and, and, and so yes, but carefully, there's a lot more to it than that, yeah, okay, yeah, 
Uh, Robert, that's very true of lots of people, I think. In high school, if one didn't drink, one didn't get invited to anything. That's a powerful incentive to learn to like drinking. Yeah, that's the belonging. Aging, absolutely. Beliefs about aging, beliefs about men, about women. We, we have them about everything. So let's talk about how to move from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. So this is in the workbooks. To obtain a sober mindset, I must commit to change be consistent and find a sober community. Commit to change, be consistent and find a sober community. Committing to change is, um, I saw someone post this in the Facebook group, I've tried everything. Usually when someone says I've tried everything to stop drinking or change my life or whatever it is, normally what they haven't tried is consistency. Consistency is the magic ingredient consistently noticing when you have a fixed mindset story and just altering it to something that's growth. And did you see how I did that? It's not, I didn't say to my son, I am an amazing artist. I will draw you the best picture of a Pokemon you have ever seen. Cause that's ridiculous, right? And the voice of my ego voice is gonna go, uh, yeah, right. I just went, you know, if I practice, maybe I can get better at this, but let's give it a go. Growth mindset, it's that easy. Does everyone feel that's possible for them? That's something they could practice. So a fixed mindset believes uh, nothing can change. Everything's going to stay the same forever. And, and the reason for it being like this is external reasons. I don't have this. I'm not there. It's not fair. This happened to me, blah, blah, blah. We don't believe we have the power to change things. So we keep failing. And this is why we struggle. A growth mindset believes change is possible. Things could be different. And maybe if I had more information and help, then things would be better. So we develop a sober mindset by beginning to understand that we are stuck in a fixed mindset. And the good news is we can change that. Not only can we change it around sobriety, we can change it about all different areas. And we're going to be talking more about that on Thursday and Friday about upper limits, limiting beliefs and how they affect not just sobriety, but how much money we make, our, our romantic relationships, our experience of life. That's what we do here. Now, I'm just going to look for Jen and get her going here. She's, uh, there you are, Jen. Okay, I need to talk. Oops. And then, okay, I'm just going to see, I know there's a way to get the video. Jen, are you there? Yeah. Um, I've done this before and then, because I want to, uh, is it, can you see a way to ask to start your video? No. Because I know there's a way to do it because we did it before. Uh, I think it's my side. Give us one second, guys, while we figure out the time. Hmm. And if anyone knows about Zoom and can help us figure out how to get the video started. Um, hold on, video. Let me hide. See, no. I know there's a way to make her a co-host. Oh, that's it, that's it, that's it. <laughs> we get there eventually. Okay, now how do I make her a co-host? I can't see how to do that. I'm sure that was how we do it. Click on her name. No, it's not. It's just saying it doesn't give me any options to do that. And I do want you to see her because she's so pretty. <laughs> um, hold on, Jen. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I don't want to disable talking because. Ah, oh, hold on. Here it is. Promote to panelist. There we go. Has that enabled you to ask to start video? There we go. 
I knew, I knew I have to remember how to do that. Yay, see, she's beautiful, isn't she? <laughs> Jen, welcome. Thank you. So could you tell people just a little bit about how things were before we started working together and then a little bit about what changed? Yeah, so it's been three years since I first worked with you. Yeah, wow. so I've worked with Veronica twice. Um, the first time was, yeah, like Labor Day three years ago. Oh um, and I had never even told anyone I had a problem with alcohol. And, but I knew I did. And I don't even, like, I heard you on a podcast. I don't even know where, but it was like, I call it like a little download from the universe. Like I was looking at your website for like a week and I just like knew I needed to hit that, like book a discovery call button. Um, Cause I was like, I've got to do something about this, but I don't even know where to start. And so, um, yeah, my life is so different as you know, from where it was then to where it is today. And, you know, doing all of this work with you has been the reason why, and also being part of sober communities and just really changing my life. Like, I think when we first met, you told me like I was a master presenter, like I was so good at presenting to the world, like that I was fine. And I had seen a numerous therapists over the years and always been told, oh, you seem fine. You seem like you're coping well, you know? And I just was so good at, yeah, presenting. That was your story, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. And it, it all comes out like to childhood, you know, and yeah. always presenting from a young age, like I was fine and had it together and everything. So it was, yeah. Um, but how did you feel inside? Not okay. Yeah. And looking back now, I can see that my life was really lonely from a very early age. And I felt that I, you know, there was just like an incongruence with who I presented on the outside and how I felt on the inside. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because of that, like, I didn't let people get too close to me either, you know? And so like, I didn't have the best friendships. I, you know, was afraid of getting hurt. You know, I just, I look back and, you know, I just, yeah, had a lot of stuff to look at and work through. And I've done that and life is so much better. So I guess I'll start with kind of like my history of drinking is interesting. Mm -hmm. that I only drank a couple of times in high school, um, but I would say alcohol never agreed with me. I think the second or third time I drank, like I got blackout drunk, lost my virginity and don't remember. And I think I threw up on him. Um, we ended up dating for like a year and a half and he said, it's like still a good friend of my life. So that was okay. But, um, you know, like it just never agreed with me. So I, you know, I do think genetically it, you know, um, and there's addiction all over my family. Um, what was interesting is I drank in college some, and it would always be like, binge drinking, partying. I wouldn't say it was like abnormal for college. It'd be a couple times a month, um, you know? And so again, looking back, not great, but not super problematic. Like I was got good grades and stuff. And, um, but yeah, it was really after college that the drinking started to pick up and that like behavior of, you know, it was modeled to me through some different like relationships and stuff of like having wine after work to relax and unwind. And, you know, I didn't have any like parental figures to help like mentor me through that well ever in life. But um, <laughs> and where it really struggled was that transition from like college to adulthood. And I was in a job that looking back was really toxic and isolating and not good. And so then I'm like using alcohol to cope after work. And, you know, it just on the outside, it never looked that problematic to people. No one ever commented on it. Like I was really, really good at hiding it. Um, and over time, yeah, there'd be like a few like times a year, you know, of like too much partying and that kind of stuff. And there was a period in my late twenties of like doing a lot of cocaine with a boyfriend. And then that just kind of went away on its own. So I figured the drinking thing would just kind of like go away on its own, but I definitely wasn't outgrowing it. 
And what really changed is I am 38 now. So when I was 33, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and it was caught early. Luckily, it was my first preventative screenings ever. My mom died of, um, well, she had breast cancer. And then when she was 40, and then she actually got leukemia um, from the chemo she did for breast cancer and died at age 45. Wow. So because of that family history, I started my screenings early and that's what caught it. And it was a very nasty, aggressive kind of cancer that they were like, if you would have found this on the you wouldn't have lived. Wow. And um, yeah. Can I, so can I just frame this? You, you knew that alcohol wasn't good for someone who has cancer, right? Only a little bit, not really, not until I wow. went through screenings and they gave me literature about it huh. and studies. I didn't know how bad it is and how yeah. heavily linked it is to cancer. Yeah. No one ever said anything, wow. which is shocking, you know, and they gave me some literature and some New York times articles and that scared me. And then I get like the notification that I need to come in for a biopsy and everything. And I'm like, Oh my God. So I don't know if alcohol gave me cancer or not. It doesn't really matter to me. Like, but I knew this was like, not good. So Luckily it was caught early and it was very treatable and I did have to do chemo and, um, radiation and just had a lumpectomy. So like in terms of cancer, yes, that was like crappy, but it was pretty minimal in terms of what cancer can look like. So I'm yeah. really lucky on yeah. that side of it. Um, and then afterwards, you know, I just, I was like, get through treatment, all of that. And then after, and I was still drinking in periods, you know, going like, this is not great, but you know, um, and then I started doing a lot of like meditation and yin yoga and working out and getting healthier. And, but the drinking was still sneaking in a few days a week. And so it was really incongruent at this point. It's like, I'm doing all these healthy activities, and then I'm like drinking a bunch of wine a few nights a week. And it was like hijacking is the only way I can describe it. Like this mental hijacking. Um, and yeah, so I think it was probably, yeah, about nine months later then after I finished treatments and all of that, that I reached out to you and started working with you. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was just like, yes, yeah, something's got to change here. And like, I didn't really know where to start having had gone to therapy and different things. Like I had a therapist once tell me to just buy like small bottles of wine to like minimize my drinking, you know, it's like, <laughs> cause I had kind of expressed some concerns around it a couple of times and it's like, yeah, no, that's not the answer. <laughs> and because you looked, I mean, you yeah. know, you have a great job, you look great. You, you know, you, you, you don't drink every day. You're not drinking first thing in the morning. Right. So yeah. everyone else is like, well, that's normal drinking. Yeah. And they're just like, my friends would be like, oh, Jen likes to party sometimes and drink, uh, you know, and stuff. And it just, yeah. Even to this day, a lot of people that are still in my life from then are kind of like surprised by it. And I do even get comments of like, oh yeah, you just kind of quit drinking. I wish it was that, you know, like I still presented that to a lot of people mm. and I still find the hardest people to really explain it to are the people who knew me drinking in the in and out, but going forward now in life, like I'm super honest about being a sober person and proud of that and like really clear and upfront about it and happy to talk about it. Um, yeah. So there was just like a lot of incongruencies there. Um, yeah. So can I, so I know you, so Jen, you did lots of things. I know um, She Recovers has been really helpful for you. And we did uh, Sober Before Women together. Can you tell us why you joined the Sober Mindset? Like what was happening? Yeah. I, Cause I know you, you, you were really moving in the right direction, but. Yeah, I would say like first working with you in that women's group, about 80% of it was like cleared up. I was like, you totally opened my eyes to like, I had no idea that my childhood was not normal. All of this stuff was affecting me, you know, and into adulthood. And I had all these limiting beliefs and all this, like a lot of like 
like programming that I needed to be caregiving and like even in like and I was hesitant about romantic relationships because of all of that and just family stuff my sister is an addict and all sorts of stuff was going on so about 80 percent of it I would say was like cleared up or like much better after that and I joined She Recovers which is like an amazing group of women I live in Seattle so it has a huge presence out here and that that would I say is like in terms of ongoing the most like supportive thing because then I started meeting women that were just like me that like yeah. Com- community community yeah, community. yeah, that had, yeah. Like, you know a lot of like their shit together looking like, you know, and, but then have this drinking problem, you know, and then I've made amazing friends in there. And I started to like open up and share and feel safe. Like safe is a word that I think about a lot lately because I didn't realize how, like, I never felt safe, like pretty much my entire life until recently. It's an anchored feeling. And that's what I was describing. I felt exactly this. It's just not feeling anchored, right? Yeah. And like, there wasn't like, emotional safety in my childhood and relationships until recently um and yeah so then what happened was even though I'd done all this work I was still drinking a little bit here and there every few months and I'll tell you that is like the worst place to be it is like hell because you're physically not used to it it's so out of alignment with what I want. And like, I really liked my sober life, but then yet I'm doing this every once in a while. And that was like really painful. And then I um, started dating somebody who also had a drinking problem. (laughs) I have a history of that too, common, you know? Um, And you know, I was much more on a sober path than him, but every like month and a half, I would start drinking with him for a day or two. And then there was a big blow up and that ended. And I was listening to your podcast one day and heard you were enrolling in this so six month sober mindset program. And I was like, well, I think that's for me. Um, I need to do more work. And so it was really the romantic relationship mm. stuff that was really you know, coming up that I really needed to continue to work on with you. And that has been life-changing. Like I am now dating and I was so hesitant to even do any dating and found it super scary and stuff. And now I don't at all. Like I've met some great people, um, but they aren't in the position for relationships. And I'm just able to like accept that and choose if I want to have friendships with them or not. And then I can easily filter out all the nonsense. Um, and not accepting crumbs from the table. No, absolutely not. And, you know, I get so many compliments about, you know, just my presence and how, you know, like people are really drawn to me now in a positive way of just like, I'm really clear and calm and kind to people. And that shows up even in dating. And, you know, I'm just very clear on what I'm looking for and what I want. Cause I have that feeling in my friendships. So mm-hmm. like I have these wonderful, trusting, great friendships. And so I like, I know what I'm looking for and I think you described it perfectly. Like it's all about getting the rest of your life together and having the life you want. And a relationship is the cherry on top. And that's how I feel like my life is really good. Like there are things I'm still working on, like money, as you brought up is one, um, that there, there's I, always, all of us oh, are always yeah. working on stuff. Nobody yeah. ever gets to, but, but the thing is we can now, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, and it's like, I look back and I'm just like, oh my God, I was living in like drinking chaos and like so painful. And it's like, my life is so peaceful and calm. And I have this like inner peace and happiness now that Mm. I've never felt or had before. And it's so nice and refreshing. And yeah, like life is pretty easy now, but it was like you said, in the beginning, making that adjustment, I call it like describing to people, like having to rewire your brain. And I'm like, yeah, it is, you know, it's challenging at first and with how much you have like subconsciously programmed alcohol into your brain, you know? Um, 
But now I don't have thoughts about drinking. Every once in a while, a little thing will pop up and I'll just be like, oh, that's curious and interesting, you know, like not doing that. Um, but yeah, things are just so much more manageable now. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Is, is, was there anything particular in the Sober Mindset program that really kind of was helped you change or any? Yeah, I think or? the resentments, especially section, um and the one I, I always still repeat it to myself because you helped me unravel things that happened with Dan the guy I was seeing and the you know I chose somebody who could not meet my needs you know and really reminding myself of that ongoing with dating is like you know people can meet my needs or not you know and accepting and seeing where people are at in reality mm-hmm. and if that works for me or not you know mm-hmm. and that that's okay if they aren't there, you know? Mm -hmm. And because I had a real bad habit in history of seeing the potential in people and, you know, kind of like, you know, the crumbs, like there would be a few good things and then ignoring all the stuff that wasn't working for me and stuff. So, and just being like really clear and kind with people and knowing what's mine and what's other people's stuff and not taking stuff personally like and being able to just really see things clearly as they are and yeah even this like programming I was around my family a couple months ago and just listening to them like basically tell me I need to care give for people and I'm like no I don't no yeah. <laughs> not my problem um (laughs) and stuff and just seeing all that really clearly without like being emotionally attached to it and it definitely takes time and practice and there's still situations that come up once in a while that trigger those feelings but for the most part yeah it's yeah that program was super helpful and the group aspect of it is really really helpful to hear other people's stories and what's going on for them and then how you might how I was maybe doing some of that or whatever Mm -hmm. um is super helpful yeah and now like I resented for a long time having to do any sort of like be in any kind of sober community do go to meetings like I really didn't want anything to do with it and was really kind of like I don't know bitter and shameful and stuff and now I go to those things because I want to it's so interesting. Like uh, I go to like refuge recovery meetings and my she recovers meetups and I go to your like, alumni stuff and it's cause I like it. Like I like hearing people's stories and being part of that community and world. So it's a huge shift. Yeah. Brilliant. Jen, thank you so much. The way I, I so I've yeah, worked with Jen for about three years now and I've seen what I see is like before you were like this and now there is expansion and all things are possible. And I've seen a massive shift and change in you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and if people, would you mind if people reached out to you through Sober for Life or whatever? Oh, no, please. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Jen. Jen is just one of those people that I'm just really glad that she's in the world. Um, okay, so I want to tell you about the Cyber Mindset program that Jen just did. I only do it once a year. It's my flagship program. It is um, deep personal work. Um, Enrollment is, it opens today. We actually already have about five or six people in this program because once people get wind of it, it's the one that people usually want to join. It runs, it's it's actually a five month program. It runs over six months. We do all of the necessary internal work that all human beings have to do. It's not just people with an alcohol problem. It's what everybody has to do. We do work on, um, we, we change our mindset. We find our limiting beliefs and we change them to empowering ones. We do resentment work. We do work, there's a whole module on early childhood stuff. Um, we look at uh, changing our habits, building a sobriety habit. Um, I lead the program and one of my coaches, Tamara, also teaches in it as well. Um, you get uh, during the six months that we have together, you do, we, we, uh, have weekly coaching calls. You get a, there's six modules, you get a video and a handout for each module, and then you get all the coaching uh, calls. So you can, we can help you, uh, practice all of these new behaviors. Um, 
we have a two day online retreat in this program. So it's online. You can do it from wherever you are in the world. And that's when we do uh, the resentment work. Um, and you also get six months free membership to my subscription group, So Before Life. The, the good thing, one of the things about my programs, once you graduate from any program, you can then, any coaching program, we have twice monthly alumni calls that you can come to for as long as you want to, that's part of your So Before Life membership. So you can continue showing, I'm Jen, I see Jen often. That's one of the things she does. I see Jen, she comes to the alumni calls. She asks for help when she's struggling or a bit stuck or needs a reframe. So I make two guarantees in my program. I will mess up your drinking. And the reason for that is because you can't unknow what I'm going to, what, what will be revealed to you. And you will experience a transformation. Because the stuff we teach is very cognitive. It's, some of it's based on rational motive behavioral therapy, stuff that I am qualified and experienced to teach you, um, that is about creating these internal shifts. And this is a program for wherever you are in your sober journey. So you can be still stopping starting, putting weight on the sober end, or you can be a couple of years sober. And you should be, uh, I'm going to put the information page up in just a second. And there's several testimonials on there as well, which you should look at to, to um, uh, their video testimonials, as they will give you an idea of, of what transformations people experience. You have to show up. I don't have a magic wand. So you have to show up for me to be able to help you with this transformation. It's very skill-based. I When I got sober and I was looking for help, I didn't need wishy-washy. I needed, I wanted someone to say, if you do this, this, and this in this way, then you're going to feel better about yourself. I wanted very specific, clear-cut instructions about how, not even to just be happy, but to how to feel better about myself. And that is very much what we do in this program. So there's a lot included in this. And um, I'm, I'm opening up enrollment now for anybody who is ready to start that work and start that journey. The link to join is there. Now, there are several bonuses. I'm going to give you the price. I'll give you all of that. Um, for the first five people who sign up, I always give away a one-to-one -one personal coaching session with me. Those typically go on the first day, just to let you know. Um, if you sign up by Friday, there's another bonus. And then there's a, another bonus uh, that we, we, we start October 6th, but we actually have a bonus session next Thursday for everybody who joins before then. So there's tons of value packed into this. Um, how do you know if you're ready to sign up? you're gonna start feeling uncomfortable. You're gonna be hearing that call to growth. You'll be, you're gonna be hearing that inside of you something pulling you and saying, there's something here for you. But it will also feel a bit scary because what we do is change. What we do in this program is things will change and change always feels a little bit scary. So um, the cost of the program, if you pay in full, is 4997, it's just under $5,000. Or you can break it up into six payments of 879. There are also bonuses for paying in full as well. So I price my programs because that's what their value is. And you need to be activated to fully commit to yourself. Money is one of the ways that we sabotage ourselves. We will spend, and one of the testimonials on that page that I just put up there, she talks about this. We will spend this on our house and our dog, on everyone else, on our garden, but we won't spend it on ourselves because we don't believe that we're worth it. By spending this money, you are investing in yourself. You are buying into full commitment to change. And I make those guarantees. If you show up and very imperfectly, I hope I stress this, messily and imperfectly do this work, it will facilitate an internal change you will see things differently, but you have to be committed to that. And this investment is how you activate that commitment and make yourself a priority because this is going to serve you for the rest of your life. Everything we teach in this program is what I do. I, this is what I do. This is how I have 22 years of sobriety. This is why I feel the way that I do. So this is not about whether 
one of the ways that one of the limiting stories that we tell ourselves is that we can't afford it and I want to say that there's no such thing now please listen to me nobody should everyone has to meet their financial obligations and I would never ever suggest that you um, don't meet your financial obligations to pay for this program I'm not saying that what I'm saying that what I'm saying is the question is not whether we can afford something the question is what is our priority right now what is my priority my priorities are here and that's where my money goes or my priorities are here and that's where my money goes. And we, if we all look at our bank statements, we'll see where our priorities are. And a lot of the time it's outside fixes. So this is my invitation to you to make yourself a priority. Um, the worst form of self-betrayal is that we don't prioritize ourselves. And you heard all of that from Jen, you know, not doing that and then finally not accepting crumbs from the table. So there's the link look at the information page there's everything you should be on there it breaks down what's in the program all of the dates and times of the calls everything that's involved um all of the different bonuses all of that kind of stuff Every, anybody who signs up and it's usually in the first 24 hours those people will get a one-to-one -one call with me and i will help you with your mindset whatever you oh and i just saw someone did there we go so there's four left um uh i will help you with whatever you need to help Otherwise, I'm going to give you the homework question because we are going to be back tomorrow. Lots of great free stuff still in this, this program. So please make sure you show up tomorrow because tomorrow I think it's almost my favorite day. And it because we're doing, um, we're going to be learning about limiting beliefs and that stuff is gold. So the homework question, and there will be, and I'll post this in the chat as well. Homework. What does sobriety mean to you? What are your beliefs about sobriety? Tomorrow, we're going to learn about how to reprogram our thinking by changing our limiting beliefs. And I will see you then. Well done for everybody who's already clicking and getting into the program. All right, everybody. Take care. Thanks for putting up for the technical glitches. <laughs> see you then.